It is a great grace to be in the presence of a relic. Doubly so when that relic belongs to an apostle, to one chosen by Christ to be among his closest collaborators, one whom Christ formed and taught, with whom he ministered, who lived with him, and who ate with him. And Jude is further special in that Jude is the first cousin of Jesus Christ. The church fathers inform us that Jude is the son of Mary of Clopas. If her name is familiar to you, it is so because she was one of the three Marys who stood at the foot of the cross at the Lord's crucifixion. There was, of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Mary of Clopas. The fathers inform us that Mary of Clopas and the Blessed Virgin Mary are blood sisters, making her son, St. Jude, and her other son, St. James the Less, also an apostle, first cousin of Jesus Christ. So we have here not just relics of an apostle, we have here family of Jesus. Many, many times, this arm embraced the body of the Savior of the world. This is how close we are to Jesus in this moment. Jude, among the apostles, is today easily the most popular. There are more shrines to St. Jude worldwide than to any other saint, save the Blessed Virgin Mary. Immensely popular. This stands in contrast, though, to his place in the Gospel. Within the Gospel, among the Twelve, St. Jude easily has the lowest place. Well, to state it in a different way. Among the Twelve Apostles, within the printed word of the Gospel, St. Jude is the biggest nobody. In the entire gospel, he utters only one sentence. And that's a question he poses to Jesus on the night of the Last Supper. And the question that he poses is this one. How come? That's it. That is Jude's contribution to the gospel. He asks Jesus, how come? Jesus has just explained that he is not going to reveal himself to the world in the same way that he has to his apostles. And that perplexes Jude, because he thinks that somehow the world is going to miss out. He thinks, he just assumes that the apostles have received more than what the world is going to get. He couldn't have imagined what Jesus had up his sleeve, namely, rising from the dead. He couldn't have imagined that. Jude does write an epistle in the New Testament. One of the epistles, he authored it. And he authored it with this arm, his right arm. But at 25 verses long, one page, it is the shortest of the New Testament epistles. When he is named in the New Testament, great confusion surrounds his name. So first of all, uh, there are two Judases among the apostles. Saint Judas, his name is Judas. We in English politely abbreviate his name to Jude to distinguish him from Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. But his name is Judas. But some editions of the Bible in English leave his name as Judas. Others change his name to Jude. So for some folks, they believe that there are two different people being spoken of. The name Judas itself was a very common name during New Testament times. It would be equivalent to Bob or Steve within our culture. So to distinguish him from the other Judases, from the many other Judases out there, some New Testament authors call him by his nickname, Thaddeus or Thaddeus, depending upon how you choose to pronounce it in English. But Thaddeus is itself 
a generic male nickname. Any male during New Testament times could have the nickname Thaddeus. The English equivalent is Bubba. We have relics here of St. Bubba this evening. As the New Testament rolled on, he began to be called Jude of James. Jude of James. Now, when you see that formula, this guy of that guy, what it means is this guy is son of that guy. So you're naming a man in reference to his father because there were no last names at the time. There were no surnames. Except when it comes to Jude, it doesn't mean that. He is being named in reference to his much more prominent brother, St. James the Less. James the Less was the first bishop of Jerusalem. Now there's a high office for you to be the first bishop of the first diocese of the world, right? So Jude is named in reference, he began to be named in reference to his brother, who was much more famous than he was. So here is the irony. St. Jude is the lesser known brother of St. James the Less. Some details have survived of his missionary journeys. We know, for example, that the first place where Jude preached the gospel following Pentecost. So at Pentecost, the apostles received the Holy Spirit and immediately they were sent out across the face of the earth. Jude went to Armenia, the kingdom of Armenia. And how that came about is fascinating. The king of Armenia had heard about Jesus of Nazareth, this Jew who went around from village to village, town to town, healing people. And evidently, his healing ministry was the real thing because news of its effectiveness had reached King Abgar all the way in Armenia. Armenia is nowhere near Israel. It is across the Asian Peninsula. So Abgar wrote Jesus Christ a letter, and he sent an envoy to hand deliver it. And his letter stated this, I hear that you are a healer. I am dying of a terrible illness. Please, if you are able, come and deliver me from it. And Jesus actually wrote him a reply. Now this is a big deal. Because this is the only time in history we have record of Jesus Christ leaving behind a piece of writing. Our Lord in his response stated this. I must fulfill the work of the one who sent me. But after I return to him, I will send someone to do what you ask of me in my name. Jude is the one whom he sent. And as a pledge that he would fulfill what he promises King Abgar in this letter, our Lord took a cloth and pressed his face into the cloth, and the image of his holy face re miraculously remained behind on it. Now, this is not the veil of Veronica. This is not the Shroud of Turin, the veil of Oviedo, or the veil of Manapello. Those are all images produced at the time of our Lord's Passion. The image of Edessa, as this image has come to be called, Edessa being the capital city of Armenia, the image of Edessa was the first of the miraculous images the Lord produced of his holy face. And it was held in immense reverence in the ancient world. Right? In fact, even today, the Eastern churches, so the Eastern Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox churches, have a special mass, a special liturgy, just for that image, which they call the Holy Mandalayan, the holy image not made by hands. The Lord sent his reply back with that image, and the two letters exchanged between our Lord and Abgar, along with the image of Edessa, 
were kept, were kept at the archives of Edessa for centuries. And they were witnessed to by a great many of the church fathers, including the famous Saint Eusebius of Caesarea, the greatest of the ancient Christian historians. Most of our knowledge of the ancient church, of the primitive Christian church, we obtain from Eusebius. And no one in the ancient world doubted the authenticity of the image or of the two letters. Unfortunately, none of the three exist any longer. They were, they were destroyed by the revolutionaries at France during the French Revolution. We possess the contents of the letters, but we no longer possess the actual letters nor the image. Regardless, the records from the time state that when Jude entered Armenia and he walked into the city of Edessa, the capital, and he, he was led to the chamber where Abgar was lying on his back dying, light was emanating from Jude's flesh. And he walked up to the king and placed his arm on him, placed this arm on him, and Abgar was healed instantly and immediately converted to the Christian faith, as, as you would do when a man whose flesh is glowing with light places his arm upon you and removes from you your lethal illness. The records state that Jude remained behind in Armenia for a period of time, and he healed a great many of the sick. And Armenia has the glory and honor of being the first nation in history to convert to Christianity in total. For this reason, when you travel to Jerusalem today, Jerusalem is divided into four quarters. There was the Jewish quarter, the Muslim quarter, the generic Christian quarter, and the Armenian Christian quarter, all because of the ministry of this man. Following his time in Armenia, the records pertaining to Jude get a little bit fuzzier. We know that he ministered in ancient Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. We know he ministered in ancient Persia, modern-day Iran. And we know that he ministered in the regions of Tyre and Sidon, modern-day Lebanon. But the records, however, are divided as to whether he met his demise, whether he suffered martyrdom at ancient Persia, modern-day Iran, or at the city of Beirut within modern-day Lebanon. The dominant textual evidence seems to point to Beirut. Regardless, all records are unanimous in that he was martyred with his missionary partner, Saint Simon the Apostle. Jude was clubbed to death and then beheaded with an axe, Simon was cut in half with a saw. Uh, it is for this reason that when you see a depiction, a pictorial depiction of Jude, he is usually depicted holding a club. And in this portrait that is here in front of you, he has it beneath his arm, which is where he is supporting the text or the paper of his epistle. Uh, in, in reference to the New Testament letter that he wrote. Uh, always, Jude also is depicted with an image of our Lord on his chest. That is a reference to the image of Edessa, the miraculous image produced by our Lord for which St. Jude is forever intertwined. St. Jude and St. Simon were buried near the place of their martyrdom, and this reflects a belief of the ancient world. The ancients believed that if your life was taken from you, if you were killed, you needed to be buried near the place where that event occurred. And so Simon and Jude were buried near the place where they met their demise, and then two things happened which form the reasons why we possess these relics here today and how we know for certain they belonged to Jude the Apostle. The first is that Christians did what Christians do. They built a church over top of their graves. 
the church itself established three things. First, it marked where the bodies were. Right? It's hard to lose track of the bodies when there's a large stone church over top of them. Secondly, it provided a place for Sunday worship. Mass from the beginning of the Christian church was always celebrated over the tombs of the saints. It is for this reason why at the start of this liturgy, at the start of this Mass, and later on at the end, this altar gets a kiss from the clerics. What we are doing is kissing the relics of the saints that have been embedded inside the altar. Every altar is a tomb. The third thing that the church established was the preservation of the bones by keeping them dry and free from exposure to the elements. Bones can keep an indefinite amount of time as long as they are kept dry. The second thing that occurred is God took advantage of pagan Roman superstition. The ancient Romans were an immensely superstitious people. They were deathly afraid of ghosts. For this reason, within their laws, there were numerous prohibitions as to what you could do to a grape. It was absolutely forbidden to ever desecrate a grave, no matter to whom it belonged. Even if it belonged to an enemy of Rome, a traitor, or, or, or someone who attacked Rome, the general of an army, uh, of an attacking army. Why? Well, the Romans believed that if you messed with someone's grave, you might stir up a ghost. And if you've got a ghost on your hands, who are you going to call? So the existence of the church answered the question, where are the graves, and how do we know that the bones were preserved? The existence of pagan Roman superstition ensured that the bones were never messed with, that they remained intact and in place until the year 335, when the emperor Constantine as he was building the Basilica to St. Peter on top of the Vatican Hill, he brought the skeletons of St. Jude and St. Simon to that basilica, and he placed them within the left wing, the left transept of that basilica, beneath the altar of St. Joseph. So the Basilica of St. Peter in the Vatican is built in the shape of a giant cross. In the left wing of that cross, at the very end, is an is the high altar dedicated to St. Joseph. The skeletons of St. Simon and St. Jude were placed beneath that altar, where they remain to this day. Some 500 years ago, St. Jude's right arm was removed, and all of the above form the details as to why we possess this arm for veneration today and how we possess the certainty aside from all the miraculous happenings that this arm has occasioned, how we possess the certainty that this arm is in fact that of St. Jude the Apostle. Following Jude's death, God performed an incredible irony with him, right? So, as I mentioned, Jude was the biggest nobody among the 12. Right? The least important apostle, if you will, at least in terms of speech and prominence. Today, he is easily the most popular among the 12. So something happened to bring point B about, point B being so different than point A. And that's what I'm going to share with you now. Upon Jude's death, he entered into the fullness of his vocation. God had a plan for Jude. And that plan was to take place and inaugurate itself only upon his death. That plan is so remarkable that the greatest events of Christian history have St. Jude's fingerprints all over them. And I'm going to share with you just two of them. 
In the year 250, Valerian became emperor of Rome. Valerian was a butcher who hated Christians. He was more of a butcher than even the emperors Nero and Diocletian. And ten, tens of thousands of Christians lost their lives under the domain of those two, under the rule of those two emperors. Diocletian, pardon me, Valerian, as one of his first acts of office, issued a series of eight decrees meant to stamp out the Christian faith from the face of the earth. And to give you a flavor, one of those, for example, stated that if you rat out on a Christian, he is arrested and then will be executed, but his property and possessions will be confiscated and you will be entitled to a cut of each of them. So there was a financial incentive for you to rat out on a Christian. Valerian issued these series of decrees and then promptly went off to make war against the Sufi of Persia, the king of Persia. The king of Persia always carried the title of Sufi. And of all of the places on this planet where those two gigantic armies met in war, the Roman and the Persian army, they met in war at the city of Edessa within Armenia. The city made Christian and made holy by this man. The unimaginable happened. To that point in time, ancient Rome had existed for over 1,200 years. Militarily, it had never experienced defeat. The Roman military machine was the most feared army in the world. It was unconquerable. So everyone thought. Until that day at the Battle of Edessa, when not only did the Roman army lose, the entire army was captured, including the Emperor Valerian. Valerian was taken off to Persia to be the personal slave of the Sufi. The records from the time state that among the other humiliations he had to endure, he had to get down on his hands and knees and serve as a stool for the Sufi to step on his back while mounting his horse. He died seven years later in captivity, never returning to his homeland again. Upon the capture of his father, Valerian's son immediately became emperor. And he recognized, it is because of what my father did against the Christians that Rome has suffered this catastrophic embarrassment. In other words, it was his belief that the Christian God was exacting revenge over what his father had decreed against the Christians. So his first act of office was to rescind the anti-Christian decrees promulgated by his father. And this began what historians today call the little peace of the church. A 40-year period, the longest in the ancient world, where Christians could live peacefully and undisturbed. Following the, well, at the close of those 40 years, the persecutions fired up again in earnest. And then some 23 years later, a young general named Constantine was getting ready to face a rival general at the Battle of Milvian Bridge within the city of Rome. Each man was vying to be the next Roman emperor. Milvian Bridge is an ancient stone bridge that still exists to this day. That battle that day is easily the most decisive battle in human history. Because if Constantine had not won that battle, you and I today would not be Christians. Constantine was outnumbered, and his men were outskilled by their rivals, and they were roundly expected to lose. 
But as Constantine was marching towards that bridge, he saw written in the sky these words. In this sign, you will conquer. And then there was an image of a Cairo, a P with an X through the stem, an ancient Christian symbol representing the first two letters of the Greek word for Christ. Constantine had each of his men paint a Cairo on his shield. And they won that day against all odds. And Constantine recognized that it was not because of his skill as a general nor the power of his men by which they won. They won, so he believed, because the Christian God fought on our behalf. And so pagan Constantine immediately converted to the Christian faith. And he made it a capital crime punishable by execution if you were to persecute a Christian. And while he didn't force anyone to convert to the Christian faith, if you wanted a position in his government, or if you wanted a promotion within the same, those were reserved only for Christians. And so protected by the strength of the Roman Empire, and now the empire's faith, Christianity was free to disseminate itself across the entire civilized world. And that is the reason why, friends, you and I are Christians. All because of what happened at the Battle of Milvian Bridge within Rome, which occurred on October 28th, feast day of St. Jude the Apostle. As the liturgy, as the Mass to St. Jude was coming to a close and the final hymn was being sung that day, Constantine was being proclaimed the victor. Following the Christianization of Europe, something really strange occurred. Something diabolical. It had to be diabolical. It was a kind of cancerous thinking that enveloped the entire Christian world. Such that from the year 500 and for the next 1,200 years until 1,700, all devotion to St. Jude the Apostle ceased. A cancerous thinking emerged that went as follows. Now, get ready to giggle, but this is exactly what occurred. People thought, if I pray to St. Judas... My prayers may inadvertently go to Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. And so they won't be heard. It's silly, but this is exactly what happened. It was diabolical. And it enveloped the entire Christian world. So for 1,200 years, no one prayed to St. Jude the Apostle. Now, I happen to think that this was a demonic revenge for what St. Jude did at the Battle of Edessa where he usurped the 1,200-year-old unbroken record of the Roman pagan army. It was a revenge. But it came to an end in the year 1700, when something remarkable happened, which had to be the work of God. It had to be. Because it occurred simultaneously, worldwide, all at once. Numerous people needing a miracle for a situation that was desperate. And having consulted every other saint and prayed and bargained with them and pleading with them and having come up short, they thought, you know, I've tried everyone else. What have I got to lose? And they sent their prayers his way. And you know what happened? Bam! Every last one of those petitions was knocked out of the ballpark. And it was from that time, from the year 1700, that St. Jude became known as the patron saint of hopeless cases and desperate situations because only hopeless cases and desperate situations were given him. And he has rightly earned the nickname of the apostle of the impossible. 
and is easily one of the most beloved saints on earth. Think of the last time that you visited a grocery store or a dollar store and walked through their candle aisle. At their votive candle section, front and center, you saw candles of Our Lady. But right next to hers, even if there were candles of no other saints, you saw candles of her nephew, immensely popular. But I will tell you this, friends. If you had walked up to St. Jude 2,000 years ago, on Good Friday, the Good Friday, in the evening, so after our Lord had already hung on the cross and his body was snuffed, and his life was snuffed out of his body, and after that body had already been taken down from the tomb and from the cross and placed in the tomb, and that body was now getting cold. And if you had walked up to him and said to him something like this, My God in heaven, one of the original apostles and a blood relative of the Lord to boot. It is an absolute honor to meet you, St. Jude. The church one day is going to hail you as one of its greatest heroes. There are going to be more shrines to you worldwide than to any other saint save that of your holy aunt, the mother of God. We are going to celebrate the most beautiful mass for you at Queen of Peace Church in Gainesville, Florida. If you had said to him something like that, at best, he would have rolled his eyes at you. At worst, he would have vomited and ran away. Because in that moment, friends, in that moment, all he felt like was a total and complete loser. Earlier that day, when his Lord and relative needed him most as he hung on the cross, Jude was nowhere to be found. His mother had the guts to stand at the foot of the cross, but he didn't. And so when the Lord rose from the dead and made his first resurrection appearance to his apostles, the first thing that the Lord had to do was forgive his apostles for their unfaithfulness. Yes, John stood at the foot of the cross at the crucifixion, but even John had ran away at the time of the Lord's arrest. So the first words that came out of the mouth of Jesus Christ when he appeared to his apostles, this is in John chapter 20, the first words were words of forgiveness and reconciliation. It, they were words of an absolution of their sins. Peace be with you, he says. But then Jude had to do something in that moment that was heroic. He had to accept the Lord's forgiveness. And that, friends, is no small thing. Because when we mess up big, when we've screwed up royally, the easiest thing to do is to hate ourselves and despise ourselves and to hold ourselves in contempt. And we can even delude ourselves into thinking that such a mistreatment of the self pleases God because I messed up and so I don't deserve to be happy. It is just that I'm miserable. We can even delude ourselves into thinking that such a treatment, such a mistreatment, pleases God. How could anything that contradicts the word of God be pleasing to God? Who commands us over and over in his word to forgive our enemies? Friends, that holds true even if our enemy is our own very self. The hardest thing, the hardest thing that many of us will ever do is to look at that person who is staring back at us in the mirror and say to that person, I forgive you. 
I release you from what I hold against you. And I ask God to give you a blessing instead. Jude did exactly that. And that, friends, was the key to him unlocking God's plan for his life. Jude could not have imagined what would transpire with his life. He couldn't have imagined all of this. All he knew was that he was the nobody. And guaranteed during that time, as our Lord is offering him to once again be on his team, as the Lord is offering him forgiveness, running through his mind, I guarantee you, were these thoughts. The Lord Jesus would be better off if he picked someone else other than me. I am too sinful. I am too weak. I am too much of a nobody. He would be better off with someone else and I should just go disappear. Guarantee you, that was what ran through his mind. Along with the shame and the embarrassment of having abandoned the Lord. But he chose to accept the forgiveness extended to him by Jesus Christ. And just look at what it did to him. It is useful to compare his response with that of Judas Iscariot, the betrayer. Judas repented of his sin. We know this. He took the 30 crummy pieces of silver he was paid to betray the Lord back to the temple authorities. And when they refused to accept it because it was blood money, he threw it away. He wanted nothing to do with it. We also know that Christ himself forgave him for his sin. At the moment that Jude planted the kiss on the Lord's cheek, the kiss, of course, was the sign of the betrayal. Judas had pre-arranged with the arresting authorities, the guy that I kiss, that's the one you want, arrest him. At the moment that Judas Iscariot planted that God-forsaken kiss on the cheek of the world's Savior, the Lord turned to him and said, Friend, do you betray me with a kiss? The Lord called him, friend. The Lord was not being sarcastic when he said that. The word, the Lord does not have a sarcastic bone in his body. Do you know what sarcasm means? It is a a word made up of two Greek words that mean to tear flesh. The Lord tears no one's flesh. He is the one who allows his flesh to be torn. When the Lord calls Judas friend, he means exactly that. At the moment that Judas commits the sin, at the moment that he plants the kiss on the tree and commits the act of betrayal, the Lord forgives him. So if Judas was repentant for his sin and the Lord forgave him for it, why do we not honor Judas Iscariot as a saint But we do St. Jude and that of the other ten apostles. Because Judas Iscariot refused to forgive himself. He refused to accept the love of Christ and then apply it to himself. And there is no glory and honor for that, friends. We cannot refuse God what he wants and then hope to be happy. That's impossible. Judas Iscariot could have been the greatest of the 12 apostles. He would have been the the apostle that we honor the most. Because if our Lord had not died, he couldn't have risen from the dead. If he had not risen from the dead, then the gates of heaven would still be closed to us. And every one of us, you and me, upon our death, we would suffer the same fate that every other soul did until the Lord rose from the dead. We would descend into hell. All souls went to hell upon the close of their life until Christ rose. 
Now, hell contained two kinds of souls, that of the damned, for which there was no return from hell, but also those of the righteous, who were awaiting the Messiah to set them free. And that's what Christ did when he died. And that's why we recite in the creed, he descended into hell. And he did so to free those of the righteous. We have the action of Judas Iscariot to thank for that. He could have been the greatest of the twelve, but he blew it. This Jude, however, accepted the Lord's forgiveness. And that for him made all the difference in the world. And so friends, at the end of this Mass, when you come up to venerate these relics, you need to know one thing. It is not just St. Jude's bones that are here in front of you. All of St. Jude is here to greet you personally. Because the soul of the saint, which is even now in heaven, beholding God face to face, living in his glory, living in perfect communion with him, that same soul is just as present in his or her relics. All of St. Jude the Apostle is here to greet you. And as an apostle, as an emissary, because that's what an apostle is, an emissary or agent, he has come a long way for the chance to meet you personally. And so when you approach his relics, you need to say two things to him. Jude, I accept you as my friend. I accept your friendship today. Say those words. You don't have to say them out loud. But when you're in front of him, say to him those words. I accept you as my friend. And then say to him, I accept the gift you have for me today. Because he's got a gift for every single person. I have no idea what your gift is going to be. It is different for every person. But you're just going to have to trust me on this one. He has got something for you. Jude, I accept the gift you have for me. I accept your friendship. I accept your gift. Give him all of your prayer intentions, but I will tell you right now what is going to happen. Either on your drive home tonight, or perhaps as you're getting into bed, or perhaps sometime tomorrow, you're going to smack your head and you're going to say something like this. Oh, good God in heaven, I forgot to pray for my sick Aunt Selma. How could I forget my Aunt Selma? I even prayed for Bob at work and I hate Bob. It doesn't matter. When you leave here today, your friend is going to leave with you. He's never going to leave you. And so when that intention, or whatever intention comes to mind, you turn to your friend and you say, Jude, I need you to do something for my Aunt Selma, or for this person, or for that family, or for this situation. And your friend who is so close to God, he is called the apostle of the impossible. Your friend is going to get to work bringing your petition to Almighty God. You are welcome. In fact, you are encouraged to touch the glass of this display case. Why? Every time relics are mentioned in Scripture, two things always occur. There is always a healing. There is never not a healing. Touch is the way by which that healing comes about. Not because relics are magical. They are not magical. But because the entire saint is present in his or her relics. All of St. Jude the Apostle is here to greet you. Whatever object you touch to that glass, any object of devotion, a rosary, a holy card, a medal, your necklace, your wedding band, it will become a relic. We hear about such touched relics in Acts chapter 19. St. Paul the Apostle would be touched with rags, it says. 
those rags would be placed on the sick. Two things would happen. Their diseases would leave them. And get this one. If they had any evil spirits, they would depart from them. Make a relic here today and take it home with you. And then down the road, when you're going through a rough time, or you know someone else who is, you take that relic and you place it on that person and you say, Jude, I need you to do something for this person. And your friend, who is so close to God, that God, God loves him so much, that God has chosen to make himself powerless to resist when he has presented a petition by this saint. Your saint, your friend, is going to get to work bringing him that petition. If you wish, there is something that you can do for St. Jude today. This relic comes from a shrine within Rome, a, shr a shrine very close to St. Peter's Basilica. It has a great big dome on top of it, very reminiscent to the domes on top of St. Peter's. That dome has been hit by lightning several times recently. It has to be rebuilt. Later on in this Mass, there will be a collection taken up, the proceeds of which will be for the restoration of that dome. If you wish to do something for St. Jude, you could make a contribution to that. But I will tell you this, friends. This tour began in September. The first stop was a church in downtown Chicago. I was one hour away from that church when my cell phone rang. On the other end of the phone was a gentleman named Doug Edwards. Doug is a man who lives in Michigan, great Catholic gentleman, great devotee of the saints and their relics. He approached me at one of my relic events years ago, introduced himself, and said, Father, I own a print shop. If you ever have any printing needs, let me know. Well, I called him at the start of the summer, last summer, and I said to him, Doug, the Vatican has entrusted me with the major relics of St. Jude the Apostle. This is the first time that his relics have left Italy since being brought to Italy by Constantine the Great in 335. I need to produce large pull-up banners. Do you do that type of work? He said, sure, Father. I said, okay. I'll send you the digital files. You can price them out, send me an invoice, and I'll fire off a check to you. Well, he said to me, Father, I'm not going to charge you. I said, Doug, I don't think you know how many and how large of banners I need. These are the banners you see all around the church. I said to him, Doug, the last time I produced these, this many banners, the cost exceeded $20,000. He said, Father, I'm not going to charge you. This is going to be my gift to St. Jude, and it's going to make me feel like I'm evangelizing alongside an apostle. What do you say to that? When he had those banners printed, I called him up. I said, Doug, I'm coming to your print shop. I'm bringing the apostle with me. So call whoever you like over to your shop, and they can have some up-close and personal time with the saint. Now, Doug's wife, Noreen, I had never met. She had, in 2001, a debilitating brain condition. Up to that point in time, she was a, a, a very accomplished woman. She was the CEO of a corporation. In 2001, she had a brain condition that necessitated surgery. And the surgery left her in a vegetative state. Ten days later, she was still in a coma. Sur the surgeons went in and did a second surgery to try to bring her out of that coma, which it thankfully worked, but it left her without the ability to walk and talk. After a very prolonged and grueling regimen of physiotherapy, she was able to relearn to, to talk, and she was able to regain somewhat of ability to walk some brief paces. Right? She could walk a very short distance, but when she would do so, it would knock her out for the rest of the day. So she was an invalid. She was unable to take care of herself. When I arrived at Doug's print shop, I said to him, Doug, 
which one of these people here is your wife? I want to pray with her with St. Jude. And he said to her, he said to me, well, Father, Noreen is not having a good day today. So she wasn't able to be here. I said, no problem. We'll go to your home and we'll bring St. Jude with us. He said, Father, I am so grateful for your kind offer. But Noreen is having a very bad day today. And she is just not up for a visit. So I went to Jude and I said to him, Jude, Doug has done a lot for you. He is your friend. I need you to do something for his wife, Noreen. The next day, Doug went home for lunch, and his lunch routine was always the same. He would go home, prepare lunch, feed his wife, feed himself, return to work. When he arrived at his house for lunch that day, the unimaginable had occurred. Noreen had prepared lunch and had it laid out on the table, which was impossible for her. All symptoms of her injuries and debilitation are gone. In that phone call, when I was one hour away from the first church to host these relics, in other words, the tour had not yet even started. Doug Edwards was screaming at me over and over, my wife is darting about the house like a young girl. The apostle of the impossible knocked another one out of the ballpark. Friends, if you take nothing else with you today from this experience, if you take nothing else home with you, make sure you take home this guy as your friend. You will never, ever regret it.